Many thanks for staying right here with us. It's um, Sports Central here on Spectrum Television. Now, let's um, uh, quickly get talking. It's that time. Uh, Mari joins the conversation now, Mari. Fine morning to have you return. Yeah, thank you very much, Fight. Good morning. <laughs> you look sharp. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, very quickly, you have um, me and Abbas Yakwan joining us uh, remotely this uh, morning from Enugu State, Nigeria. And of course, we'll be talking about a barrage of issues. Uh, Nigeria's out in the Commonwealth Games, D6. Well, mixed fortunes, depending on how uh, you look at it. May and a good morning. Um, fine to have you join us here. Uh, good morning, Bright. Good morning, uh, Marizona. Great to have yeah, you. Been, uh, uh, to join us. Yeah, been a minute already. Uh, how's it, Nugu? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, so just, uh, just trying to work. Uh, we thank all the security. Well. All right. Well, I see Nugu is treating you because you're looking sharp. <laughs> uh, <really>? <laughs> <laughs> all right so um let's get talking very quickly and uh, begin a conversation from the commonwealth games well well mixed reactions for team nigeria that's why all of the hopes following the 100 meters and the fact that we had uh, bokova at least qualifying for the semi-finals you know we're talking about the likes of um ray monoko and and the rest of you know the guys that competed in, in, in that particular one and in the women's event who had the likes of rosemary chukuma grace Wokocha, you know do gabriel couldn't make it to the finals um uh, could only finish sixth in her semi-final hit but all of that came to nothing no medal for team nigeria after day six so how would you describe or how would you cap off day six for team nigeria uh, I think, first of all, uh, I will start off with the men. I was disappointed that, uh, mm. you know, the man called the Nigerian nightmare, Favor Ashe, he's the fastest man in Nigeria, the national champion. I remember how he broke that record. I was disappointed that uh, he didn't progress to the finals. But for the rest, the likes of Raymond Quavo, I, I think they're just coming through. Uh, also, Brume, also coming through. My hopes also on uh, Favor Ashe. But he disappointed me. Uh, he did great in the heat. Uh, he dominated the heat and then going to the semi-final, I expected him uh, to do better, get into the finals at least. But for the women, uh, I think we have to give it up to Grace Walkercha. We have to give it up to Grace Walkercha and also Rosemary Chukuma. They did the best. For Grace Walkercha, dominated the heat, progressed to the semi-finals, also did the best. But look, when you're up against the top notch, you're up against an Olympic champion, when you're up against the Jamaican ladies, uh, Thomas, uh, hell, who won the event? I mean, it's always going to be a fast race. But was I expecting anything? I wasn't really expecting anything. I was just expecting the ladies to get through the final. But I was expecting a whole lot from Fabian Shit. But he's still a young, he's a young athlete. So I mean, it's just this is his first Commonwealth game. So maybe we need to forgive him. Maybe we need to move on. Rosemary Chukuma also have first Commonwealth game. So these guys and these ladies are just young athletes. It's just the first time, maybe the second time they will improve. Maybe they will get to the podium. All right now, um, Maru talked about this yesterday. And, you know, Bladen put a very strong statement saying, well, maybe this is an indictment on, on the quality available for Team Nigeria. Maybe right. these guys are not just good enough or as not good as um, we think they are. You know, um, uh, what do you make of that? Well, Maine has made a case for, you know, uh, sure, the likes yeah. of Fivo, uh, you know, Ashe, and, and the rest of them, Rosemary Chukuma, say, well, this is their first Commonwealth Games. Is it about how big the occasion was, or is there an indictment on, you know, how much quality they really possess? Well, first of all, right, I think it's a gradual process. When you look at these players, you know, the champions at the national level, you know, play, you know, they competed against athletes from Nigeria. It's a different ball game when you travel, where you go, you know, go global. You're competing with athletes from different countries. You talk about Australia, you talk about England, mm -hmm. you talk about South Africa and the rest of them. It gets difficult. You know, you talk about India, who were particularly fantastic in the heat yesterday. So it's difficult, you know, you know, to put that quality side by side with what we have in Nigeria. So like Mayini said, it's the first time, you know, they're experiencing the Commonwealth Games. And they, they definitely understand the quality that, um, that they have experienced in the Commonwealth Games. And then they'll try to improve their game into maybe another tournament that they'll participate in so as i said yesterday you shouldn't just clearly completely write them off it's an experience and i believe that you know in subsequent games subsequent tournaments they'll do a lot better because they've come to realize that you know at the national level you know things are different from what we have at the global level it's come our games so yeah. it's something different quality all around so i think they'll do a lot better and i think we should cut them some slack they deserve uh, you know to be you know celebrated at the end of the day right now you know uh, mainly the the fear for many is that 
This is just the Commonwealth Games. And of course, it's, um, you know, for countries associated with Britain, basically, and, and nothing more. So if they can't, you know, if they can't compete favorably, you know, with the athletes at the Commonwealth Games, um, what more or how so will they compete? How will they compete at the Olympics when you're having, it's a more global tournament where you're having, you know, people from different countries of the world, different continents of the world, and uh, the, the golf in quality and, of course, uh, the gab in experience and all of that, you know, will broaden. Is that a fear you have? Well, uh, but first of all, I think my fear is uh, the lack of, um, should I say, in terms of quality, in terms of preparation. I'm more concerned about how these athletes prepare for games. Uh, yeah. let, me, let me show you an example of what's been happening in uh, the men's athletics in the track and field. Mm -hmm. This is what has been happening. Mm -hmm. This is what has been happening. Forget what Tobio Monsen has done. That's for the women. But for the men, it's not going on. It's going down. It means the young athletes coming through, they need time. Do they prepare enough? Do the ministry, do the Athletics Federation of Nigeria prepare these guys enough? No, they don't. If they don't have scholarship in the United States, probably we don't have, even have top level athletes. And you have to give kudos to making of champions, the MOC, that's what they call them. They were the one that discovered Fabo Ashi, who is now a national champion. Who also broke the record in the last trials and in the last national championship. So we need to prepare well to compete favorably with other continents. Goodness me, Sri Lanka got fed yesterday in the men's 100 meters. The first time ever. Sri Lanka, a country, we know what's happening in Sri Lanka at the moment, that a Sri Lankan athlete got drawn in 100 meters, it shows that there is some sort of commitment. Favour Ashe to me could compete with Sri Lanka athletes. Favour Ashe could compete with the Englishman who came forth. So I, I just feel we need to prepare more. We need to keep preparing more. He has the quality. The likes of Raymond Cuevo, these guys are just young, young guys coming through. They need time. They need time. For people who are just known to be Muslim now, and uh, maybe S.A. Bruma now. There was a time S.A. Bruma and Tubi were just coming through. Mm -hmm. The weight of expectation is much. I understand. But these guys need time. It's time for the ladies to shine because they've been under for a very long time. So I, I think we need to be more deliberate. That's the key word. Let's be more deliberate. Invest more in the preparation of these athletes. And I think they will turn up. Right now, um, let me get back to you now, Marion. Let's talk about, you know, some of the things Benyeri talked about, you know, early preparation, you know, the facts that we've not been consistent in terms of preparation and, of course, we've not been very deliberate in terms of planning for some of these big occasion, big events. Yeah. But overall, despite the, um, the shorty preparation, what do you make of Nigeria's participation at the Commonwealth Games so far? Right, three gold medals, one silver and four bronze medals, eight in total. I think it's commendable, you know, uh, for a set of athletes who are participating in this competition for the very first time, bulk of them participating for the very first time. You know, so imagine if we're having eight medals uh, due to lack of preparation. Imagine when we don't prepare better, prepare well competition like this. I think we'll do a lot better. Will we ever prepare well? But that's the problem, Bryce. And I think, you know, when Mary was talking about preparation, I think it's an all-encompassing thing. And it goes beyond just athletics. You know, look at basketball, the Tigers, I think, last year, when they were playing for the, you know, women's Afro basket, they had, they, they started camp i think a week before the tournament that's actually very poor and then there was so much you know blame games around flying you know this of youth in sports the federal government you know mbbf and all of that so it's it's a problem in the system and once we fix that systematic problem of you know poor preparation and lack of um, interest and investment into sports in the country i think we we'll do um we we'll be doing badly particularly so i just hope that things get better but um, these athletes are doing very well despite the stories that we're having in the country where athletes are not properly treated, you're heading into t tournaments like this. Bulk of them are coming from the USA, and that's because you know they understand that the country you know, right now you, they will be treated as 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 well and as better as they will be treated, you know, overseas. So I think the story should be about you know investing a lot more into sports and trying to do the right thing, and m maybe from there we would um, compete more and win more medals. Like many say, Sri Lanka winning the medal, that's crazy. As compared to Nigeria. All right. Now, Mayne, let's see, look, look at the, the games um, in total beyond uh, just athletics. Now, 
I remember, remember in 2018, we were in Abuja for the National Sports Festival, and then, you know, Edidion, Mofia, yeah. who won Nigeria, you know, a silver medal in, in weightlifting, you know, emerged there. You know, that structure in place now, and of course, we've seen that steady progression. You know, um, on a personal note, how, how did that make you feel seeing Edidion on, on, on the big screen, landing a medal, not just for Aquaibon, but Team Nigeria now at the Commonwealth Games? Well, I was, I was so happy. Uh, I was so excited. Mm. Now, you, that God, you know the story of the video. And, I mean, after the games, the National Sports Festival in 2018, where he emerged as the national champion, in fact, the last uh, National Sports Festival, I think that's in uh, 2020, 2021, in uh, Benin City, he also emerged national champion again. I, he won three gold medals, he dominated his class, his weightlifting class. Remember the, uh, the Nigerian weightlifting championship in New York last yeah. year, when yeah. he broke the national record and also set the national record. Mm. I was also super excited. But you know what my, my takeaway was from that event at the Home Hall? When we had, uh, you know, uh, a trace... Mm. A lack of equipment, a complaint about facility, that what that was there, in, I don't know if anything has been done, at the Uyo Township Stadium, that the facilities is horrible and all of that, that he needed, uh, he needed equipment so he can prepare well for the Commonwealth Games. I also remember, we spoke to uh, Coach Lawrence Kipwaibu, uh, who at that point was vying to become the national, the Nigerian weightlifting federation president, although he lost her, but he was key for that weightlifting championship to come to Uyo. And he said, look, as a federation, we are working to see how we can get facilities, equipment for this athlete. I also remember how he used to text me and send me messages. He would be saying, media, uh, I still don't have facilities. We need a way forward. I'm going to dump a five home. I'm going to go to another state, maybe a door, maybe a uh, Delta state. So because there's better welfare in those states, and they will appreciate what he's been doing. So when I got that message, when I, I watched, I watched it, I stayed up and watched it, I was so excited for him. He almost got silver. He also almost got gold. But the key thing is, in his debut on the Commonwealth Games, against the odds, against the lack of facilities, against the lack of equipment, against the lack of uh, motivation and all of that, a Didion still pushed. Edidion showed the Nigerian spirit. Edidion showed the never say never spirit. Against the odds, to get us right, I think it was massive. It was, it was, I, I mean, it was a day to, to relish mm. that against, I mean, against the odds. You know what happens when they are giving you 1.03 mm. and then you're giving you 15 odds against people like the Indians and the rest who have better facilities and you come on top? No, it was a great feat. I yeah. can only wish that he would be rewarded. Well, I, I'm very sure there there are more Didions, you know, um, waiting around uh, the city of Uyo, scattered across a Kwaibom, waiting to be discovered. And uh, well, we'll be talking about the um, national, uh, the Kwaibom Sports Festival. Well, we heard from the commission a couple of days ago that we should have that twice before the end of the current administration. And we're hoping one of these days. Um, would get the commissioner to come here, sit, talk with us about uh, the um, sports festival here in Aquabum, the plans, and of course, beyond this administration, uh, what the plans are to, you know, make it, you know, a yearly thing. You know, basically, you know, give, give the um, sports festival here some legislative backing so it outlives a particular administration. But for now, let's leave there very quickly. Mary, let's talk about tennis. Right. Tennis stories this morning, uh, starting with the um, Washington Open. Nick Kyrgios is doing something fabulous. Yesterday we talked about him, you know, he loves to play tennis, enjoying ah. playing tennis at the moment. Fresh off uh, the Wimbledon finals, mm. uh, saw off um, an American in the final, in the first clash, yeah. and had another American <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I saw him off and has now set up a third round clash against the big serving Riley Opelka. Well, right, interesting stuff. Mm. You know, definitely we're talking about a man who has decided to play tennis finally.
mm. you know, went to the Wimbledon Open final, and then there was so much talk about, well, this man has got quality at the end of the day, despite all of the bad talk about him, you know, being a bad boy of tennis and not playing well. But in the last two games he's played, you know, after the Wimbledon final, he showed class, he showed that of, uh, actually he actually you know, can do a lot, you know, to tennis in the next couple of games. And I, I also love the fact that, as I said yesterday, he's added discipline to his game. You know, he's, um, he's a little less emotional, you know, in games like this. He just focuses on playing tennis and not trying to upset his opponents, upset, you know, the umpire and all of that. A fine st straight set tweet yesterday showed that he's, he's got class. But, of course, he has another opponent in Riley Opelka. Like he said, it's um, a tricky game because Opelka is one um, opponent, one player that definitely knows how to upset the big guns. He tries to make sure that uh, he puts up a fine fight against, you know, players that are seen as, you know, top-notch players, are seen as, you know, you know, highly ranked players in tournaments like this. So I'm looking forward to how he puts up a performance. I'm expecting him, Bright, particularly to go all out and win this one and increase his style, increase, you know, his rankings and definitely, you know, probably prepare well for the US Open. Uh, if he could reach the final of the Wimbledon in England, there's a chance that maybe that quality can continue, that consistency can also continue and it takes you through to the US Open, another tour level, uh, uh, tournament before the end of the year. Right now, uh, Main, I know you're a big fan of uh, Nick Kyrgios. Um, what have you made of this? What do you make rather of his meteoric rises, particularly as improved his racket uh, to 23-7? 23 wins, 7 losses. Uh, seen, two, seen of two Americans, you know, he would face Riley Opelka in the third round. Marcus Guerin in the first round. Tommy Paul yesterday. And the journey continues for Nick. Um, you know, have you been impressed with um, Nick's uh, going so far this particular year? Uh, I think, um, you know, network is... Uh... Mayor, can you hear me? Yeah, so yes, we're, talk yes, yeah, we're talking about, um, you know, Nick Kyrgios. I know you're a big fan of Nick Kyrgios. So basically, I'll ask you, what do you make of the interior rise for him this particular year, reached the Wimbledon final and has continued that massive form ahead of the US Open, the last Grand Slam of this particular year, of two Americans so far. Uh, Marcus Guerrero in the first, Tommy Paul yesterday, setting up that third round clash against Riley Opelka. Well, uh, I think uh, I just have to be happy for Nick. Uh, he's been tapped a bad boy, although he's been showing the tendency on the court and all of the fines and all those uh, rash behaviors and all of that. But I think I'm super excited for him. Uh, I just feel like probably he didn't get to face Novak at the Wimbledon. He probably would have been a Grand Slam winner. And, uh, I'll be more excited now. But I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. I know him to be a hugely talented uh, tennis player. I think it's just, just been a case of maturity. It's just been a case of keeping his head down and just concentrating more in the game. Um, just allow whatever is coming from the side not to distract him. He has been distracted for far too long. Mm. He has been distracted for far too long. But keeping your cool, concentrating more in the game, yes, sometimes the game might not favor you and uh, you might get frustrated. But I think he's maturing. And uh, I will not be surprised in no distant time he reached the Grand Slam. So I'm just, I'm just so excited for him for being the bad boy. Now people at the world of tennis, tennis fans are really seeing the quality that I've seen in Nick for a very long time. All right. Now um, let's hit the breaks here very quickly. And um, when we return, we talk about football stories, beginning with the uh, statements made by Napoli president Aurelio De Laurentiis yesterday, and transfer stories where Pernambuco Bamian has come up this morning. Kasmas Michael is also another big name we we'll talk about in finer details after the short time. So stay right here with us. Heroics of the man, Casper Michael. Uh, thank you very much for staying right here with us on uh, Sports Central here on Spectrum Television. Uh, Maris, you here, Maris, who the man has finally uh, gotten his desire that switch from Leicester to Nice. Mm. Well, uh, you know, I've been battling with that. Um, <laughs> what's the attraction? 
Yeah, what's right. there in Nice? We're from Leicester. I think the question should be, what, what's the situation that made him leave Leicester City to Nice? You know, first of Leicester City are still trying to balance their books according to the stories that we're getting. Mm. They haven't been able to find a balance between, you know, income and expenditure, you know, arrivals and departures. So they need to let go of a few players so as to balance the books. And that's basically why they've decided to let go of the man, Kasper Schmeichel, who decided to leave for Nice. Nice have qualified for, you know, European competition. Uh, yeah. Big thanks to Christoph Gattler, who was yeah. there last season, helped them qualify, I think, for mm. the Europa League. You know, so I think he goes there and as to the quality, he's 35 and then the few clips we've seen clearly shows this man has got quality. You know, despite his um, age, you all know goalkeepers in football, age with grace. You know, so he, he gets there, adds to the quality and helps them in European competitions. He's been there before, played in the Champions League with Leicester City at some point. So he goes there to help them. But I think it's sad for Leicester City. You know, they are the only team in Europe's top seven league to not do any signing. And that's due to their financial situation, not being able to balance the book. So losing this man for me is going to be a big miss because you'd find it hard to replace a goalkeeper as committed and consistent as uh, Kasper Schmeichel, you know, for you as Premier League side, that we understand that Premier League is definitely very, very serious and very competitive because strikers want to score goals and you need a consistent and good goalkeeper as Schmeichel for you there. So I think it's going to be, it's going to be a big miss for Leicester City, but he goes to Nice and has the quality. And of course, I mean, a new terrain yeah. is played in, in, in his hometown, Denmark, in England mm. as well. So France is good. It's a good, it's a good way for him, right? All right now, um, Worrisome for Leicester because, um, according to reports, are yet to get a replacement as we speak and on the verge of also losing before the end of the transfer window could lose up to three players. Wesley Fofana getting close to joining Chelsea and Madison is attracting interest from Newcastle. Well, we understand the first bid of about £40 million pounds was rejected by um, Leicester City who are holding out for their £50 million pounds valuation of uh, the uh, playmaker. We wish him the very best. Well, he leaves a championship winner, a Premier League winner, but of course not forgetting the FA Cup that recently won at the expense of Chelsea Football Club. Well, many are wondering, Chelsea would have to be dragged into every single football conversation <laughs> these days. Now, let's leave the very quickly and uh, talk about Aurelio De Laurentiis and the statement he made yesterday as the Napoli president and that has sparked a lot of reaction from um, Nigeria, across the continent of Africa and beyond. And, and now let's, you know, take a quick look at um, what Aurelio said and me and I would uh, quickly share his uh, thoughts with us on what he made of that particular statement. Aurelio yesterday now said, and uh, I quote the Napoli president, uh, paraphrasing, it was basically talking about African players and the fact that for Napoli to sign African players in the future, they would have to sign a contract which prohibits them from playing at the Africa cup of uh, nations and that sparked lots of reactions and um yes it in, uh, i think we should you know take a look at that in in full glare and of course quotes the man line for line said and i quote i love them but either they sign something confirming they'll back out of playing the african cup of nations or otherwise between the tournament the world cup qualifiers in south america these players are never available were well, the idiots who pay salaries only to send them all over the world playing for others. Uh, May, you know, what do you make of um, this statement from Aurelio De Laurentiis, the Napoli president? Um, when it broke, <laughs> what was your initial reaction to it? First of all, uh, I'm not surprised. He's a movie man. De Laurentiis is a movie man. And I've always felt like he has this tendency, mm. you know, uh, well, did I even expect him to spend that much on Victor Simon? Uh, at some point, I thought it was a joke because I always felt like the Laurentiis had tendency of being a racist. So when that came through, I didn't really give attention to it. Uh, but it's quite heartbreaking that a man who is a president of a huge club like Napoli will come out to make such statement. But there is another side to that story. And I think the part we need to look at is the fact that it's the clubs that play these players. That's number one. Number two, when these players go to the tournament to pick injuries, please, who treats this player? Steal the club. They'll return to the club and they'll get treated by the club. I would love to understand the angle Dylan is coming from. And that's the angle of pain. That look like Vito Cine, like uh, Zambo Mbuiga. Those guys are key, are key players in the pool. So imagine losing them. As soon as the second half of the season starts, you're losing your key players to the outcome. So 
that to me should send a signal to Ka. Mm. What if you could shoot it to, to, to the summer? Why not shoot it to the summer? Because the black players, the African players, are in disadvantage. Now, how many top clubs are going to sign the African players now? Because when a top club signs an African player, it means when the African comes, he's going to leave. So when these white folks want to sign black players, African players, they have, they have a rethink. Is it worth it? If I spend a hundred million pounds on men to go to Manchester United, I know when Nigeria comes, because he's going to go to Nigeria. Remember the case of Emmanuel Davis? At the airport. What happened? They won. Ismaili Assad, the Senegalese, had to fight. Had to fight to get released. And we thought we in the middle. Right, now, now we're in no intent. So, no intent to call you short there. No intent to call you short. But now let's talk about the other part of the conversation. So if we're saying let's shift it from January, February, um, where when it is currently played to uh, June, July, well, that's the off season. But of course, you must put in the weather conditions here in Africa. Does it favor the June, July movement? Because it has to be something that's feasible that will work with us as Africans. We understand our unique challenge during the June, July period. All right, may, may I? Uh, yes. Uh, all right, I think you missed me for a bit. Now, I was talking about the, uh, the June-July conversation now and the conversation about the weather conditions here on the continent of Africa within that period. So if we're saying let's shift it from January, February to please the European club honours and, of course, to have these players available to play for the European clubs. Uh, how about the continent? Uh, how do we deal with the challenge of the weather conditions owing to... Uh, the heavy downpour we have in, in June, July? Well, first of all, uh, if you're, you're, I think you're making reference to what happened in Cote d'Ivoire. First of all, uh, I want to use this video to, uh, to slam car because, first of all, you knew that there are going to be weather, weather situations or it's going to be heavy downpour in Cote d'Ivoire. And you have to keep it this long. Like, if you're giving, look at what people do in Qatar. They knew the situation in Qatar. What did they do? They push it down to November, and they push it down to November, but make sure the logistics and every single thing was put in place. But what did CAF do? CAF waited up until eight months to the after to shift it and come out with an excuse of weather condition. We are not supposed to do their research first. Now, I take you to the research part. Before you give voting rights to any country, are you not supposed to do your research? While you're saying, do they have the facilities? Oh, are they going to build new stadiums? Those are the things you do. You function in the weather conditions. Now, it's going to come to a, uh, a situation where the continent will have to choose either to lose their big stars or go ahead with the airport. And I tell you, you know what happens in African football. These players want to play for their country, but who foots their players? It's the club. Now, it's going to come which is okay, I'm going to stay with the club and the country. So this battle will continue. This battle will continue. Now, we need to find maybe the European clubs and can't sit down the mountain. Mm. Yeah, well, it, it definitely so, sounds like we'll have to, we'll have to find a common players. ground, you know, between, so, you know, the club honours, European club honours, and calf because you know I, I feel that's where the conversation will be directed in, in the first place well um i think we're having you know um you know serious network issues there with that particular connection it's not really as uh, smooth as not been in the last couple of seconds but um we'll continue the conversation here now uh, move on to transfer summary very quickly chelsea <laughs> they strike us so badly and are now turning their attention to the man who just left Arsenal uh, for Barcelona in Pierre Emerick Obamia. Well, we understand there's that relationship between yeah. Thomas Tuchel yeah. and uh, Aubameyang back in their days in Germany at Borussia Dortmund. Well, how about the, the fear of um, Thomas Tuchel and his playing pattern 
you know, not favouring Alanao strikers? Well, Bright, I think first off, um, let's talk about Chelsea. They're in a very sad situation. They're just mm -hmm. going for, you know, the available legs. You know, the quality players have already left the market and then they're just <laughs> trying to see if they can squeeze in and then beg people yeah. to sell their players off oh. for them, which is particularly very beg. sad. Yeah, beg at the end of the day. So, uh, I think, you know, for Perimek Aubameyang, uh, quality-wise, he's got that quality. He came to the Premier League in less than two seasons. You know, he was highest goal scorer. You know, you know, was uh, joined with Sadio Mane and Mohamed Salah that particular season. So, yeah. he's got 92 in 163 appearances for Arsenal. So, the quality is there. But, like you said, the concern of um, him being suitable and um, to the Chelsea pattern is um, a thing of concern for me because, you know, what Tuchel played uh, at Bruce Dortmund, it's not the same thing. He's trying to same strategy at Chelsea. It's a lot different and that might be a problem. And, um, right, I think what I'm concerned about particularly is the fact that both of these this transfer mostly signings are not sanctioned by Thomas Toko. I think they are just basically spearheaded by Todd Bolly and then Toko has to just settle. Yeah. Because I, I don't really see how things will go down like this at Chelsea. And then it looks like they're just dumping players on Thomas Toko and telling him, well, Fofana will come and see you. Aubameyang <laughs> will come to you and all of that. Try to walk them out, which is particularly very sad for me. <laughs> yeah, that sounded funny. Like, I would send Fofana to you, I would yeah. send Aubameyang to you. <laughs> I would have sent Koulibaly to you and Sterling as well. <laughs> do with them whatever you wish. Uh, all right, so, um, Mayone, what do you make of this transfer link? Uh, Pierre-Marc Aubameyang, well, the man who wants to stay at Barca, he just moved there after all. But Chelsea are in daring need of a striker. That is, they can't leave all of their goal-scoring burden to Amando Broja, can't they? Uh, right, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, so I'll take that again. What do you make of that transfer link in 60 seconds? Uh, Pierre Mekabamiang, you know, um, in talks to, to join Chelsea, we understand. You know, what do you make of that transfer, you know, negotiation beyond that? Aubameyang just got to Barca, and the man obviously has plans to stay. But Chelsea, they haven't got strikers. Well, having, I, I having just... you know, allowed Romel Lukaku joining Inter Milan on loan, they only have... Amando Broja, they can't allow their goal scoring burden to rest on the youngster, can they? Uh, I think it's just it's just insane. It just shows that the transfer market is just it's just uh, out of this world. But I think if Pierre Emerick Aubameyang decides to return to England, fine. I think it's going to be a good move. The romance mm -hmm. between Alba and Chelsea will be inch perfect for me. But do, does he need to move? I don't think so. But he knows he's going to play second fiddle to uh, Robert Lewandowski at Barcelona. But financially, they're looking at the options available. I think it will be a great move if Oba decides to go to Chelsea. A return to the Premier League and maybe a point to prove to us in a football club that is still good enough. I think it will be a good move. All right. <laughs> well, that would be another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mari. Uh, Thank, Thank you, you Mayen, for joining the conversation as well. Thank you for your time. We thoroughly appreciate you. Thank you very much. Yeah, continue to enjoy. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> All right. Well, That's the much time allows us to go here on uh, the show this morning. Um, we'll return tomorrow with more uh, stories for you from the sports sphere. But for now, let's wrap. Have fun, guys. And the conversation continues on social media, Spectrum TV, NG, on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, and, of course, on Instagram. You can also join us on our websites www.spectrumtv.ng on youtube check out spectrum tv you get to enjoy all of the exciting content enjoy the rest of your day we're out